Dear Holy Father, we, we know that we do not earn the right to partake of this beautiful ordinance that portrays the death of your darling son. And yet we know you've invited us by grace through faith and our simple childlike reception of that. You've invited us to come as those baptized Christ followers. And yet, Lord, we also read in your word that you fence off this table too. You taught your apostle to warn people not to partake of this lest they eat and drink death unto themselves. So thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for salvation by grace through faith. Help us as we've renewed our covenant with one another in your presence today. As we've shared together the Lord's Supper, as Jesus exhorted us to do, to remember him, not stray from him. For those who are here don't yet know him, we pray that, that the elements passing in front of them would grip them with the reality that they have been left out and then teach them by your spirit that they've left themselves out and save them as they cry unto you. For those who've gone astray, who if they were sitting here would not be eligible to partake, we pray that you will rescue, recover, return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. We're looking at the third and final installment, and I'm going to have to move like Jehu through the streets of Jerusalem to cover all of this today. While you're turning there, let me say to you, bonjour. Comment ça y est? And you respond, muy bien. Say it with me. Muy bien. Together. I didn't hear anybody but me. Muy bien. Can y'all, is my microphone on? Muy bien. Muy bien. Bonjour. Como se dice? Muy bien. God bless you. That means I'm, I'm fine. All right. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13. Stand with me if you would. By the way, I said good morning. How are you? Maybe that's why you didn't answer. You didn't know what I was asking you. Maybe you thought I was saying, would you like me to pass the offering plate again? 1 Corinthians 5. Well, today we're going we're to read the 13 verses. We're going to shift our emphasis to the section toward the end where we learn Paul makes a distinction between those who live immoral lives and are not, have not made profession of faith, not connect themselves to the, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and those who are in the church living immoral lives. He's going to challenge us to think about that. Follow along as I read. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who's done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And if as, as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you're to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And here today, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. 
For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. We have just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we need to learn today. We need to learn to balance. Because I think, I think the church in the West very often gets this flipped. We're going to look at that in a minute. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, these last verses in this passage place Christ followers in something of what I call a, an evangelical velvet vice grip. On the one hand, we're not to wink at sin when someone who identifies as a brother or sister in Christ continues unabated headlong into a scandalous lifestyle. You demonstrated your commitment to that last Sunday. I didn't say it then, but I want to add to that. When you do this, when a church takes this stand lovingly, redemptively, pre be prepared for the devil to throw the kitchen sink at you. He hates it when you take God at his word in these areas. And I can tell you this past week, some of us had the devil's kitchen sink thrown at us. And it wouldn't surprise me if in the future, near future, we come back to the very setting we found ourselves in last Sunday. So we're not to wink at sin. When a, when a confessing believer, a brother or sister, carries on headlong. But on the other hand, we are not to intentionally avoid gospel interactions with those who make no claim to be followers of Christ and live lives that offend God's holiness. And I think we do just the opposite very often. We, we wink at sin among ourselves. We, we go into this whole thing, well, I love that person. And if, if it's a family member of somebody, well, we don't want to upset so-and-so. We come up with all these excuses not to do what the Scripture clearly says we should do regarding redemptive corrective church discipline. And then we are brutally harsh on those outside. The song that Josh sang earlier, I appreciate that so much. Maybe we need to put down our signs, cross the lines and reach out in love. And so there's a tension here, and we dare not let go of it. If we let go of it on one end or the other, we let go on the, on the membership side, then we will be loose, and you'll have, you'll have situations where, where there are people living in scandalous sin. I've told you before I was at a church, went to a church, didn't know about it at the time, got there, found out uh, the choir was having uh, wife swapping going on on the weekends, and they sang pretty on Sunday morning, but it was going on on the weekends. It was, there was immorality in the church. It was commonly known. And I walk in blindfolded with a bat. And the mayor and his wife said to me at one time, you made this church a laughing stock by what you're doing. And I said to them, no, no, no. It was a laughing stock when I got here. Nobody's laughing now. We let go of the tension. Church just becomes a place where people are practicing hypocrisy. Let go of the other side, then we'll cut ourselves off from the world. We love one another by faithfully warning and exhorting one another as we, as we read in our covenant. We love the world by going to them as they are, not requiring them to change in order for us to love them, not requiring them to change in order for us to serve them. And people look at that and say, well, you're, you're inconsistent. No, we're biblically very consistent when we do that. Well, I told you what the points were, just that we've gone over five of them, the absolute scandalous situation in the church, the atrocious attitude of the church, the apostolic charge to carry out church discipline, the awful leavening influence of unchallenged sin, the application of Christ's death to congregational integrity today, the actions of Christ's followers relative to the ungodly. So Paul says in these verses 9 to 13, he, he deals with toward those who are of this world. He says, I've written, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. By the way, that letter's lost. We don't know what that letter is because this is what we call 1 Corinthians and there was something before it. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers and idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. In other words, to, to try to live a, quote, separate life. And you read about it every now and then where some congregation 
uh, sells their houses. Somebody in the, in the congregation bought a mountaintop somewhere in Arkansas or Colorado. And they all move up there into a Christian commune. And they, Paul says, if you, if you think that way, you would need to leave the world. If you're, you're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to love sinners for Jesus' sake, but we're not to love the world or the things in the world. It's attention. Then he says, but now I'm writing you to not associate, not, not have companionship with, not, not pretend you can have fellowship with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty. Remember I said the only thing that triggers the steps of church discipline is an unwillingness to repent. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed, I'm not talking about a one-off here where a fella, a fella stumbled, but a person who is involved in this and basically says to you by word and or deed, it's none of your business. And the answer is you made it my business when you covenanted with me in this church. If they're guilty of these things, not even to eat with such a one. Probably what he's talking about there is, is not, uh, if, if they had need of food, you wouldn't say, well, I can't feed you because of your condition. Probably talking about the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table here. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Now he's back to talking about those in the world. We're not to be judgmental toward them. Stand for righteousness, yes. Speak the truth, yes, in love. We don't judge those outside. God does that. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Be careful here. He's not saying be judgmental. But he's saying that we have to do what Luke's gospel, Jesus said in Luke's gospel, stop judging by outward appearances and make a righteous judgment, a judgment according to God's righteous standard. The seventh commandment was being trampled underfoot in Corinth. Sexual immorality. It says God judges the ones outside. We'll, we'll leave that to God. And then he closes the path. Purge the evil person from among you. It's interesting. Paul didn't say the guy's misguided. He's had it rough. If you only knew about his background, his childhood, he's got mommy issues. None of that stuff. Purge the evil person. Evil because he would commit to following Jesus Christ, come out of the, of the pagan, immoral, Corinthian climate, identify himself with that, with that huddle of Christ's followers, and then carry on just like he could have carried on as an unbeliever. R.F. Gates used to say about things, when we would, it, well, he and I would ride into issues, <laughs> He would look at me after some meetings we had and he said, now Bill, I want to ask something. Did that fellow have to get saved to be that way? In other words, did it take getting saved for him to be so mean, so lackadaisical? Or could he have, could he have been that way as an unsaved person? And that's the issue here. This fellow in Corinth, did, did sal is this what salvation did to you? Is this what grace means to you? That because of the grace of God, you can go live like you want to? Purge the evil person from among you. And you did that last week. Not, as I said, not because we're doing this, wiping our hands, no, because the name of Christ is on this place. The churches all over this country that have memberships of hundreds and thousands, but couldn't get them there unless they told somebody they were getting ready to fire the pastor. That might motivate some to come, but you couldn't get them all there for anything. That's an offense to God. John Owen said, this living head, Jesus Christ, does not admit of dead members in the temple he is building. And so, that's the contrast there. But I want you to think about what he said about those outside. And ask ourselves the question, well, what did Jesus do? And I'm going to have to cover this quickly. There's about, there's about six passages I want to point out to you where Jesus ministered to sinners as sinners, not asking them to jump through hoops, sinners as sinners, 
and then putting his claims upon them. And it stirred up the ire of the religious people. Kevin DeYoung has a great article I would commend to you in the Gospel Coalition titled Jesus, Friend of Sinners, But How? Some of this I draw from him. He says everybody that knows anything knows that Jesus associated with sinners and then they take it and run different ways with it. People, he said typically, this is, I agree with him on this. So Jesus ate with sinners. He said that becomes Jesus loved a good party. You've seen that. Which becomes Jesus was more interested in showing love than in taking sides. And then that becomes Jesus always sided with religious outsiders which becomes Jesus would blow, I don't understand this one, Jesus would blow bubbles for violations of the law. But the idea is that to paint this picture of Jesus, that he just wasn't that concerned about truth and righteousness. All in the name of recognizing scripturally that he ate with sinners. And so Young makes this observation. He says, here in that kind of mindset, we have an example of a whole truth, Jesus ate with sinners, being used for a half truth, in the service of a lie. So let's look at some passages real quickly. The first one we're going to look at is with Jesus uh, and Levi, the tax collector. We read it already, Luke 5, 27 to 32. We know that him doing this, when he said, follow me, he did. He rose it, went, left everything. He made a great feast for Jesus at his house, and the people grumbled and fussed at the disciples. Now you'd have thought they were excited that Jesus had invaded the IRS of their day and that there were many of these people who were coming under the influence of Jesus' teaching. They missed that completely. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners, they asked. And his answer was, those who are well, in other words, if you, if you look, at, look at sinners outside and think that you're better than them, then you have the mentality that you're well and they're sick. If those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He said, I'll, t I'll take your argument, Jesus says. You think they're sick, I've come to heal them. We're told that as he reclined at table, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with him. There were very many who had followed him. The second thing I want you to see is he rebukes this fickle generation. You remember this in Luke chapter 7. There's other passages we could have. I just drew most of these from Luke. To what then shall I compare this people? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you, in other words, we, tried, we, we, brought, we brought joy and you chose to be sad. We brought a dirge, funeral music, somber, sad music, and you wouldn't weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come, very differently, eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And that's, that's where this idea of being Jesus' friend of sinners comes from, this Jesus saying what you say about me. But wisdom is justified by her children. In other words, those who are really children of God will see the difference. Third thing is this Jesus and the sinful woman who anointed him with oil. In Luke 7, 36 to 50, I just want to hit this. A Pharisee had asked him to come and eat with him. So he went. And while they were eating, by the way, he didn't just hang out with those who were not, not religious. He's at a Pharisee's home here. A woman in the city who had a reputation of being a notorious sinner heard about Jesus and she ran in with an alabaster flask of ointment. And she was standing behind him at his feet, and weeping, began to wet his feet with her tears and then wiped them with the problem. My, my picture I have is she was weeping so bitterly, her tears were falling on his feet and it probably embarrassed her and she thought, oh my goodness, so she took her hair and began to wipe his feet off because her tears had touched this holy man, the Pharisees. And then she, she began to anoint them with the ointment she brought. They said, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who this woman is. <laughs> she's a sinner. He's not all he's cracked up to be because he's not very discerning. Jesus answering him. 
This fellow said this to himself. How would you like it if you were sitting there and you thought something of, 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 a, of a teacher and the teacher said, well, let me tell you about that. Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Say it, teacher. In other words, I'm teachable. <laughs> Certain money lender, and he tells this story, remember, about the fellow who, who owed uh, 500 denarii and the other owed 50, and you know the story. It's a, it's a tragic story. He says, which one would love more? Well, the one that was forgiven more, surely. He said, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. That was common custom of, a, of someone journeyed from afar. They would have a wash basin. And they or one of their servants would wash the feet of the journeyman as a, as a token of we want to have be a clean, refreshing experience for you. You gave me no water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, a kiss of greeting, welcome to my home. But from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You do not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with oil. The anointing of oil was again a refreshing from the journey experience. I'll tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. He who's forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Of course, that provoked puzzling questions. Go, he says, your faith has saved you. Then the tax collectors and sinners draw near. Uh, Luke 15, 1 and 2, of course, the story, the, the three stories, the, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Follow after this. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. The contrast, you see. Over and over. And then, of course, Jesus and Zacchaeus, another notorious tax collector. You're keeping track. He's, he's about to wipe out the, the Roman form of illicit gathering of money. He entered Jericho, passing through. Zacchaeus was in a tree. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from I'm going to your house today. Remember that? You learned that growing up, singing that. And that's what happened. Well, transformational. Man who made his, his living and his livelihood stealing from people under the arm of the government Stands up. The complaint was he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. What does that imply, by the way? It implies that we're not sinners. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. This man has, is liquidating 50% of his assets. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, he hadn't gotten there all the way there yet. I return it fourfold. So he's not just liquidating half of his assets. It's going to be much more painful than that when, it's, when, when all the counting is done. Jesus said, today this salvation has come to this house for he also is a son of Abraham. That, that, that spiritually, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Then the final one. Jesus, friend of sinners, who's riding in the sand the woman caught in adultery, John 8, 3 to 11. She's caught in the very act, teacher. I've always been curious about the hypocrisy of that because if she was caught in the act of adultery, there was somebody else, a man who didn't get brought in. The law of Moses says, Stoner, what do you say about the law of Moses? So Jesus starts writing, and different commentators have suggested different things, maybe writing, maybe writing their sins maybe writing the names of people who had visited this prostitute who were in the crowd, maybe just writing the Ten Commandments down. Whatever he wrote got their attention. Stood up and said, well, get on with it. If you've never sinned here, you cast the first stone. Whatever he's written on the ground has exposed them to themselves and maybe even to some of the people standing there with them. They went away. Jesus looks at her and says, woman, where, 
We're the ones who condemns you. She said, no one, Lord. Neither do I. Go in front now and sin no more. If she had said, that's none of your business what I do with my life. We don't get that though, do we? Transform. So what do we learn? Well, we see that Jesus was drawn, pardon me, sinners were drawn to Jesus. Let me tell you something, I, on, on the lines in the song, Josh said, the world is coming to you and, and tripping over us. Jesus rightly presented is very compelling to a hurting world. Not, not, to the, not to the intelligentsia, not to the arrogant, the people who think they know more than God, but people who are hurting. When he is rightly presented, it's very compelling. A lot of compassion. Sinners were drawn to Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus also gladly spent time with sinners who were open to his teaching. He taught his disciples, go into these towns. They won't hear you. Wipe the dust from your feet and move on. He would send them to towns where there would be unconverted people there. He was very uh, willing to spend time with people open to his teaching. So should we. Jesus forgave repentant sinners. He didn't gloss over anybody's sin. Go and sin no more is not letting anybody off the hook. And Jesus embraced sinners who believed in him. He's the friend of sinners. Today, we need to not be going with the flow of our culture who's unwilling to bring integrity to the membership of a local church, unwilling to practice to the, to the biblical conclusion, redemptive, corrective church discipline, as long as unrepentance is the, is the attitude that's met with it. And willing to love sinners as sinners. And not require them to be like us, not require them to believe like us, not require them to jump over hoops for, in order for us to love them. Our Savior, who said in Matthew 18, put Treat this one as a heathen and a publican if he will not hear the church. Said to sinners, neither do I condemn you. That's part of the way you handle, as we wrap this passage up, that you handle redemptive, corrective church discipline. Because it's all love. It's all matched with love. You don't, you do redemptive, corrective discipline to love those who have identified with the local body. You do you do love for sinners outside the church. It's, it's all driven by the love of Christ shown to sinners. My prayer is that whatever faces us, because I'm telling you, the enemy of our souls is angry today. And we smelled his sulfurous smoke this past week. He's going to test our resolve. But we've got to show that we understand the difference. How you love brothers and sisters who go off into sin. And how you love a world that lives in sin. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we know it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. His, his sinless life, his substitutionary death bearing in his body our sin on the tree, enduring your wrath for sin, rising three days later to validate the reality of forgiveness that comes from you to all who repent. Father, I pray that you would help us. We live, we're going to leave here later today. We're going to go back to neighborhoods where we're surrounded by sinners, some of whom, perhaps many of whom, show no interest in you at all. It's too, it's too easy to judge them, Lord. Help us not be judgmental. Help us to love them. And then, Lord, as we move forward as a congregation, help us to love one another by tenderly holding one another to the standard that you put upon this church. It's your imprint. It's your word. And help us provoke one another to love and good works to be disciples who make disciples in such a way that those disciples make disciples. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.